Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we come to air this week. A radio amateur receives a patent for a real-life cloaking technology. Quantum radio may offer a new twist on communicating in problematic environments. The California Thomas Fire response demonstrates amateur radio's social media value. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai cancels his appearance at the Consumer Electronics Show due to death threats over net neutrality. Thousands of amateurs are getting their grid on. An Urban Explorer's video reveals a side of the old Hera Arena that's hardly ever been seen. No sunspots are making propagation a little weird. And Bulgaria finally ends its telegram service. We will have details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT, and what's new with all those amateur satellites orbiting the planet. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here with all the latest internet and technology news. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, says it's not slippery, and other lessons he's learned. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here to begin his series entitled Amateur Radio History Headlines. We'll have an update on some interference from those inexpensive Chinese handhelds. And are you experiencing extraneous noises or RFI on your ham rig in your home or in the car? We will have a talk given by Ohio trucker Jerry Stanford, N8YMP, who dealt with RFI in his truck as we accept this talk from the 1995 Hamvention. All that and more is straight ahead as edition number 984 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in Albany, New York, where it's been below zero for days, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from the lake effect snow capital of the world, Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the below zero tundra of these western Catskills of New York, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from our Central Florida News Bureau, where the weather is still a bit chilly, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Remember all the technology that was in use in the Star Trek television series? Well, yet another piece of Star Trek technology has made it into reality. Nathan Chip Cohen, W1YW of Belmont, Massachusetts, the founder of Fractal Antenna Systems, Inc., and inventor of the Fractal Antenna, has been granted a patent for deflective electromagnetic shielding, essentially cloaking technology to defend against detection by radar and similar technologies. Ham radio experimentation can lead to some pretty cool inventions, Cohen said in response to a recent QRZ forum post about the patent. Let's keep that spirit alive in 2018. The patent covers electromagnetic cloaking deflection of, among other things, satellites, rockets, towers, antennas, vehicles, body coverings, ships, spacecraft, and even people. Much time and effort has been devoted to the quest for so-called invisibility machines, the patent's background information states. Beyond science fiction, however, there has been little, if any, real progress toward this goal. According to the detailed description, the technology provides one or more surfaces that act or function as shielding and or cloaking surfaces for which at least a portion of the surface includes or is composed of fractal cells, small fractal shapes functioning as antennas or resonators placed sufficiently close to one another so that current present in one fractal cell is replicated or reproduced to an extent in an adjacent fractal cell. Without being limited by any theoretical explanation, surface plasmonic waves are believed to cause such replication in conjunction with evanescent waves. The resulting surface would deflect around an object. In terms of backscatter upon which radar systems depend, Conan has explained it this way. The incoming wave reflects off a boundary condition at the object. Its reflection is out of phase and phase cancels with the incoming wave. Bye-bye backscatter. 
Fractal Antenna Systems first publicly demonstrated person invisibility in 2012 for a Radio Club of America audience. He also has demonstrated invisibility cloaks at Hamvention and at the AWRL New England Division Convention. According to the Business Wire release, the technology produces the desired effect without any requirements on special orientation, composition, or shape of the object. The cloak deflector can be very thin, and the effect can happen over a wide bandwidth. The company noted that cloaking applications concentrate on microwave and infrared wavelengths, although the technology and patents apply to visible light as well. Camouflage and projection methods are easier and cheaper at making something disappear to the eye. But at radio and heat wavelengths, the cloak technology is an important enabler. Cohen 62 applied for the patent in 2012. An AWRL Life member and active DXer, he has been a radio amateur for more than 50 years. Researchers at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, have demonstrated that quantum physics might enable communication and mapping in locations where GPS, cell phones, and radio is not reliable or doesn't work at all, such as indoors, in urban canyons, underwater, and underground. NIST announced a technology advance on January 2nd. The technology may have marine, military, and surveying applications. The NIST team is experimenting with very low frequency, digitally modulated magnetic signals which propagate farther through buildings, water and soil than conventional electromagnetic signals at higher frequencies. The big issues with the very low frequency communications, including magnetic radio, are poor receiver sensitivity and extremely limited bandwidth of existing transmitters and receivers. This means the data rate is zilch, said NIST project leader Dave Howe, AD0MR. The best magnetic field sensitivity is obtained using quantum sensors. The increased sensitivity leads to better range. The quantum approach also offers a possibility to get high bandwidth communications like the cell phone has. We need bandwidth to communicate with audio underwater and in other forbidding environments, he said. NIST researchers have demonstrated detection of digitally modulated magnetic signals by a magnetic field sensor that relies on the quantum properties of rubidian atoms. The NIST technique varies the magnetic fields to modulate or control the frequency, specifically the horizontal and vertical positions of the signal's waveform produced by the atoms. NIST developed a direct current magnetometer that uses polarized light as a detector to measure the spin of the rubidium atoms in a tiny glass cell induced by magnetic fields. Changes in the atom's spin rate correspond to an oscillation in the DC magnetic fields, creating alternating current voltages at the light detector and are more useful for communications. Atoms offer a very fast response plus high sensitivity, Howe said. Classical communications involve a trade-off between bandwidth and sensitivity. We can now get both with quantum sensors. Hal speculated on an amateur radio application. The quantum radio is great fun, far better sensitivity than with any other receiver at room temperature anyway, Hal told the AWRL. The atoms in a glass cell replace the antenna and detection in the classical sense. It would be nice to try modulation in the 2,200 meter band using the quantum receiver for detection. In the future, the NIST team plans to develop improved transmitters. In the NIST test, the sensor detected digitally modulated magnetic fields with strengths of one picotesla, or one millionth of the Earth's magnetic field strength, and at frequencies below one kilohertz. To further improve performance, the NIST team is building and testing a custom quantum magnetometer. Like the atomic clock, the device will detect signals by switching between atoms' internal energy levels, as well as other properties, Howe said. The researchers hope to extend the range of low-frequency magnetic field signals by boosting the sensor sensitivity, suppressing noise more effectively, and increasing and efficiently using the sensor's bandwidth. The NIST strategy requires inventing an entirely different field, which combines quantum physics and low-frequency magnetic radio, Howe said. Federal Communications Commission Chairman Agent Pei canceled his scheduled appearance at a major upcoming tech industry trade show after receiving death threats, two agency sources told Recode on Thursday. The threats have intensified following an FCC vote to repeal net neutrality rules. It's the second known incident in which Pei's safety may have been at risk after a bomb threat abruptly forced the chairman to halt his controversial vote to scrap the U.S. government's net neutrality rules in December 2017.
For both pay and the whole of the FCC, the uptick in security concerns also presents a serious challenge to their ability to discuss critical tech policy issues in public view without jeopardizing their safety or the well-being of others in attendance. In this case, the exact nature of the threat made in advance of Pay's first chat at the 2018 International CES isn't clear. A spokesman for Pay at the FCC only said Thursday, we do not comment on security measures or concerns. But sources at the agency said that the federal law enforcement agencies had intervened in the matter and other FCC offices are expected to be briefed on the matter. The FBI did not immediately respond to emails seeking comment. A spokeswoman for the Consumer Technology Association, which puts on the annual Las Vegas-based trade show, also declined to comment. Earlier, though, CTA's leader, Gary Shapiro, told the publication Digital Trends that he did not know why pay had canceled, but raised the fact that he had recently been subject to vicious and direct attacks and threats. For months, pay has been hounded by his critics, who view this vote to repeal net neutrality rules as tantamount to destroying the internet. The FCC chairman has lamented that he and his family have been mocked, attacked, and threatened in public as well as on Twitter, where Pei himself is active. Meanwhile, Pei has largely confined his interactions with media to conservative outlets, including the Daily Caller. He drew immense backlash, however, because the video that he filmed with the site included a woman who previously had promoted the Pizzagate conspiracy theory. Nevertheless, the chairmanship of the FCC is an especially public role, and threats to its leaders and commissioners aren't exactly new. In 2014, for example, protesters descended on the home of then-chairman Tom Wheeler, a Democrat, and prevented him from leaving his driveway. Then, too, net neutrality had been the issue at hand. In the most recent debate, though, tensions have been especially high, driven in no small part by broader frustrations among the public with the Trump administration at large. If the death threats continue, it is unclear how Pei and his fellow commissioners will proceed. For now, Democrat Commissioner Minion Clyburn and Republican Commissioners Michael O'Reilly and Brendan Carr each plan to attend CES. So will Maureen Olhausen, the acting leader of their sister agency, the Federal Trade Commission. Olhausen has been slated to appear alongside Pay at the annual Vegas event. Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club members kept a close watch on the Thomas Fire after it broke out in early December. Using a variety of the club's analog and digital amateur radio assets, radio operators were able to observe firefighting efforts firsthand and pass along immediate information often before it was reported by official sources or by the local news media. SPARC operates five communication sites in Santa Barbara County, including sites on Diablo Peak and the mostly uninhabited Santa Cruz Island and on San Inez Peak. These two sites host Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, or ADSB, receivers, which are connected via a combination of amateur microwave IP links and mesh networking. They were used to track and monitor airborne firefighting activities Levi Maya K6LCM Co-chair of SPARC's Telecommunications Service Committee told the ARRL. Starting in mid-December, around-the-clock emergency net convened on two meters as commercial power for much of Santa Barbara County was cut and the fire descended on residential communities in Santa Barbara County, prompting multiple evacuation orders. With repeaters on generator power and many operators running on battery power, net traffic consisted of official information, which included evacuation orders, Live reports on the rapidly approaching fire line from operators who remained inside the mandatory evacuation area. Related traffic about firefighting efforts and wind and weather conditions. SPARC volunteers set up an ad hoc remote receiving station to stream live fire ground and air communications audio over the internet and mesh network. As fire crews came off duty, one firefighter and amateur radio operator joined the net to offer first-hand account of operators from ins an insider's perspective. SPARC members also assisted visiting fire crew members with mobile radio antenna repairs in the field. Maya said social media proved to be a valuable communication asset, as most official organizations, such as Incident Command and Emergency Management Agencies, were disseminating information via Twitter immediately upon release. Amateur stations without power, cell phone, or internet access could be kept informed of important information, including evacuation orders, via the amateur radio net, Maya explained. The club also served as an aggregator for the Thomas Fire-related information by featuring tweets on the club website. 
The still burning Thomas Fire, the largest in modern California history, caused devastating losses in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. Although the Santa Barbara Aries Group never activated, amateur radio provided to be a valuable mode of communication, especially when coupled with social media, amateur mesh networking, IRC chat over the mesh, and the internet, as well as live audio streaming, Maya said. In Ventura County, the Thomas Fire damaged or destroyed some amateur radio resources normally available to provide emergency communication. It was an amateur radio TV camera that caught the first images of the Thomas Fire on December 4th. A fundraising effort now is underway to help a repeater system operator to replace gear and to bolster the rest of the system for future such emergencies. Fundraising spark plug Ben Quo, KI6YR, said the fire demonstrated the difficulty in keeping equipment running in remote locations during fire emergencies. We also discovered other sites faced serious limitations after utility power was cut and solar panels were obscured by vast clouds of smoke, Q recounted in his solicitation. This GoFundMe campaign will go towards enhancing the existing ham radio repeater network to make it more reliable in emergencies. High quality video cameras for those repeater sites is another possibility. During the Thomas Fire, Quo helped bridge the divide between amateur radio and social media and even firefighters would check his feed to see what was going on in other areas of the fire, he said. It's a very powerful combination, Ku told VC Star. An ARRL member, Quo of Newberry Park, founded the SoCal Tech News site. He's been licensed for three years and serves as an ARRL technical specialist for the ARRL Santa Barbara section. And they're off. New Year's Day, January 1st, UTC, marked the opening day for the ARRL International Grid Chase 2018, or IGC. To tell us a little more about the launch of this exciting year-long contest, we go to Steve Ford, WB8IMY, reporting from League Headquarters. We are five days into 2018 and five days into the ARRL International Grid Chase competition. Among those hitting their grids early was newly minted general class operator Katie Thompson, KI7HCX, of Mount Vernon, Washington, who used the occasion to embark on the chase and get into HF for the first time using her own call sign. The 11-year-old comes from a ham radio family. Her dad, Todd, is W7TAO, while her older brothers are Mason, K7MWT, age 15, who upgraded to Amateur Extra at the exam session where his sister upgraded to General, and Tanner, K7TMT, age 13. The chase is off to a rousing start with more than 5,500 participants from around the globe already showing up on the leaderboard. Point totals for the international grid chase are shown for confirmed contacts only. While the leaderboards are not based on real-time data, they're updated several times a day. All contacts on all bands except 60 meters are valid for the grid chase provided both stations upload their logs to Logbook of the World and get a match. The objective of the year-long event is to work stations in as many different Maidenhead grid squares as possible. Each new grid square contact, confirmed through Logbook of the World, will count toward your monthly total. Stations do not have to exchange grid squares for a valid contact, although it's anticipated that many operators will do so. Some rare grid squares will be in demand. Members of the Marconi Cape Cod Radio Club, KM1CC, at the Cape Cod National Seashore will activate rare grid square FN51 on January 18th and 19th for the International Grid Chase. Complete details of the ARRL International Grid Chase appeared in the December 2017 issue of QST. For more information, contact the ARRL Contest Branch. We will have continuing coverage of the ARRL Grid Chase Contest throughout the coming year. You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Reminiscent of underwater footage from a TV documentary about the discovery of a long-lost vessel, a recently posted YouTube video takes a deep dive into the innards of the former hamvention venue Hara Arena and has been attracting notice within the amateur radio community. The narrated video probe was posted December 22nd by Once Occupied, an urban exploration group that originated in Dayton, Ohio. It's not the first video of the derelict Hara Arena since it closed. Then anything is sought to be of value inside was auctioned off. The IRS put the Hara Arena complex itself on the auction block last August to satisfy a tax lien, but no successful bidder was ever announced. 
It's not clear whether the three-person once-occupied expedition had permission to be inside the arena, nor how the individuals, who do not identify themselves, gained entry to the building. Among the more fascinating revelations was how much equipment, event paraphernalia, and just plain debris remained inside the 165,000-square-foot Hara complex, which included an apartment. This is creepy and surreal, but I couldn't turn it off, and I had to watch the whole thing, said Pete Varus, NL7XM, the QCWA's official call sign historian, who shared the video with his colleagues at the QCWA Board of Directors. You'll recognize entire areas that teamed with activity during every hamvention. He continued, it looks like raw footage from Chernobyl after the Russian nuclear disaster. The urban explorers were a bit more mundane. The facilities included a pub bar, a ballroom, a conference center, ice rink, and four exhibition halls. The place is huge. The narrative posted more than a 20-minute video clip. As the once-occupied team noted, our arena over the years has played host to sports teams and top entertainers, including Elton John and the Rolling Stones, as well as to Hamvention. Hara's shutdown in 2016, in part forced Hamvention's move to its current venue at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia. A lot of this particular video covers the parts of the Hara never seen by Hamventioneers, including catwalks, tunnels, behind-the-scenes rooms and facilities, such as offices, kitchen areas, and storerooms, some of which still contained unopened goods and supplies. While cabinets still store paper files and abandoned computers and other equipment are scattered about, at least one box the group encountered contained new T-shirts for a sports team that once made its home there. Some areas of the building's interior seem to have been hit by a tornado. Other explorers didn't appear to take anything from the Hara or disturb what remained behind. Our passion is exploring abandoned places. We explore because we love adventure and the thrill of the hunt, once Occupied says on its Facebook page. Documenting our journeys through digital media allow us to share the stories of the past. The group warns that such exploration is not without risk and not for everyone. The AM Rally Special Event once again is inviting operators to explore the original phone mode over the February 2nd through 4th weekend. Co-sponsor Clark Burgard, N1BCG, said the event is intended to be both fun and educational and encourages all amateur radio operators to get on AM, possibly for the first time. Because of research and interest in AM, the event is also an opportunity for amateurs new to AM to learn about proper settings and get the most performance out of their station, whether it's modern, vintage, tube, transistor, software-defined, military, boat anchor, broadcast, homebrewed, or commercially made, Bernard said. The AM Rally website includes tips and suggestions for various transmitter types, as well as links to additional information. Certificates will be awarded for most states contacted, and most contacts overall made by stations in five power output classes. Some special recognitions will be made on an ad hoc basis, Burgard said. The AM Rally gets underway at 0000 UTC on Saturday, February 3rd, and concludes at 0700 UTC on Monday, February 5th. Bands include 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, and 6 meters. The 2017 AM rally, which was held in April, was a huge success with nearly 1,500 contacts reported on the 72 logs submitted. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Radio Amateurs of Canada, or RAC, has announced a new partner with Radio Amateur du Québec, or RAQI. In October, RAC and RAQI representatives convened to consider how the two organizations could work together for mutual advantage. One area is to combine outgoing QSL Bureau efforts. In the face of the declining use of QSL cards and increased postal costs, it makes sense for us to work together, RIC President Glenn McDonnell, VE3XRA, said in announcing the collaboration. We have agreed that RIC Outgoing QSL Bureau will become the only outgoing QSL Bureau for Canada. The former RAQI Outgoing Bureau will become a branch of the RAC Outgoing Bureau and will continue to receive cards from RAQI members, sort them, and then forward the cards to the RAC Bureau. The new QSL Bureau arrangement went into effect on January 1st. McDonnell also said the RAC will promote Outside of Quebec, an online amateur radio course that RAQI offers. 
For Canadians who are working to obtain their amateur radio certification, this will make available another method that's particularly useful for those unable to attend courses offered by local clubs. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1894 through 1899, Marconi conducts his wireless experiments in Europe and sends a message across the English Channel. The first article on building a wireless set appears. 1901, Marconi sends a wireless signal across the Atlantic. 1900 through 1908, thousands of Americans experiment with wireless. Few at this time are interested in it as a hobby only. 1904, J.A. Fleming develops the two-element diode vacuum tube. 1906, Lee DeForest develops the three-element triode vacuum tube. R.A. Fessenden uses the Alexanderson alternator to make the first voice and music transmissions. 1908, a possible beginning of amateur radio. Prior to this time, interest in wireless had primarily been either as an experimenter or as an entrepreneur. By 1908, definite hobby interest exists among users. 1909, the first radio clubs are formed. Spark and the long waves between 300 and 6,000 meters are king. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. On Saturday, December 16th, 103 new radio amateurs passed their examination and entered Cuba's third category license, CL Prefix, while about 100 expanded their privileges by moving to the country's top categories, CM and CO. 98% of the promotion passed this official exam, exceeding by 8% the exam of the first semester of the year. The Federation de Radio Aficionados de Cuba, FRC, continually grows and directs their action to increase its presence in mountainous and inaccessible localities, as well as to elevate the number of women and youngsters amongst its members. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Bob Allison, WB1GCM, the ARRL Assistant Laboratory Manager and our tester for product review. Hi, folks. <laughs> and, Bob, you were telling me just a moment ago, in fact, that some overseas manufactured FM handheld transceivers have actually been caught in the act of causing interference. Yes, I've just recently got reports from California that the inexpensive handheld transceivers um, have a batted harmonic on uh, on 70 centimeters. That is a third harmonic, which is higher than uh, allowed by FCC emission standards, it is uh, getting into the inputs of 70 centimeter transceivers. If you take the two meter frequencies that and multiply it by three, they fall into the 70 centimeter hand band. Yes, they do. I guess that's a good thing, I suppose. Uh, but, uh, however, uh, the uh, third harmonics of two meters, uh, and some of the operators have the in inexpensive transceivers, they've been traced down and they've found out that uh, these guys, when they're on two meters with these inexpensive handhelds, are now getting into the 70 centimeter repeaters out in California. 70 centimeters is used quite a bit yes. out there because... Uh, of the needs and uh, all the uses. So this is the first time that we've heard about it. We're just learning about that at this point in time. And it's the first example of these inexpensive handhelds harming uh, other radio communications. Fortunately, it's our communications and not another radio services. If that should happen, that's a bigger problem. Much bigger. So. In other words, these guys, if I understand you correctly, uh, they're operating on two meters with these little radios. Uh, but when they're operating on two meters, they're generating a harmonic up on 70 centimeters. A third harmonic, yes. And interfering or keying up a repeater there. Correct. That's what's happening and causing interference. Wow. Real world interference from these things. Absolutely. Well, I hope you're on top of it, Bob. Oh, yes, we are indeed. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Bob. You're welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
Come on, take a free ride on the tech train. And did you see the article in the Wall Street Journal? <laughs> I thought this was out of the onion a couple of weeks ago. Millennials discover new way to get TV free. <laughs> they got an antenna and they interviewed these kids in their 20s. I didn't know this still was around. You can get, did you know you put an antenna up and you can get TV free? They were like shocked. Amazing. You can get, did you know there's TV floating through the air all the time? And all you need is this little device and you can watch it at no cost to you. The Wall Street Journal article titled Millennials Unearth an Amazing Hack to Get Free TV. <laughs> the, the, the antenna. <laughs> wow, those millennials. Is there anything they can't do? I think that's actually, I shouldn't perpetuate this. There's a definite trend among the media, which is mostly old folks like me, to diss people in their 20s, to mock them. These kids today, and uh, I don't, I think millennials are, um, I asked my daughter who's a millennial and my son who's a millennial, they, they knew about antennas. What they do with these articles, they find somebody who's really just dumb. And then they say, look, here's a millennial. See how dumb they are? And it makes us old folks feel well. So I apologize. I thought it was an Onion article when I first saw the headline. I thought, you're joking, aren't you? <laughs> Millennials discover an amazing hack to get free TV. Dan Sisko has discovered a technology that allows him to access half a dozen major TV channels completely free. I was kind of surprised this technology exists, says Mr. Sisko, 28 years old. It's been awesome. It doesn't log out and it doesn't skip. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? Boy, I strongly recommend uh, not using an out-of-date operating system. Microsoft has a, and I think a fairly reasonable policy over time of, of discontinuing operating systems. I think after 10 years, something like that, they say, look, you know, you can keep using it, but you should know we're not going to support it anymore. And more, most importantly, we're not going to support it with fixes. Every, humans are fallible. There is no perfect human. And since software is an incredibly complex thing made by humans, particularly an operating system with hundreds of millions of lines of code, it is even more fallible. It is even more likely to have flaws. There has not been a program written yet that doesn't have some flaws. Uh, in fact, the U.S. military and NASA have spent a lot of time and energy to create uh, ways of assuring that a program is perfect. And even those programs aren't perfect. They're perfect enough to send a man to the moon and get him back safely. But they're not, they're not maybe completely perfect. But that standard is a much higher standard than Microsoft or Apple or IBM or anybody puts towards its operating systems. It's just impractical to say, no, we're done. This is perfect. There will never be a problem. It just doesn't happen. So over time, usually at least monthly, uh, these companies will send out patches, fixes, changes to the operating system that you apply that fix a problem. Sometimes the problem is that the operating system crashes or is unreliable. Often though, if you can get a program to crash or be unreliable. The next step is you can weaponize that flaw. And hackers spend a lot of energy and time doing this. Weaponize that flaw. Make it useful so that you can take over a computer. That's the ultimate goal of any bad guy is to get that computer to do something he wants, not something you want. Whether it's send spam or more, more commonly these days, attack other computer systems or most commonly scramble your system and ask you for money saying if you ever want to see your data again you'll send us some money that's the most common these days that's malware that's software that you get on your system and it, and it does bad things to your system you can prevent malware to some degree by being uh, careful and we certainly talk a lot about that not only by running an antivirus that, not, that isn't really the most effective way to prevent malware just being careful about where you get files what programs you install you don't open email attachments please do not don't click links in email don't click links in messaging you say but leo but that's what i do on my computer well don't type it in by hand if you have to uh, clicking links is very dangerous generally uh, bad guys will try to get you to run a program of theirs trick you into it. 
There are all sorts of ways to do it. You know, send you a file saying, "You look at this video. You won't believe what I saw." Or, you know, here I've got some great pictures that you're going to love of your favorite celebrity. Whatever. Get you to open a file and by doing so, infect you. But if you're careful and you don't open attachments, that's not going to work for them. Unfortunately, these flaws in operating systems can let them in even without your doing anything. And that's what's really scary. You can be all the careful in the world, but if your operating system has a hole in it, a place where a bad guy can get in, then he can get in. Because you're on, if you're on the internet, he can use it and get in. We've seen so, I mean, everything has flaws, as I said, and bad guys are always working hard to use those flaws to get into your system, whether it's to put malware on it or what. Put A lot of times, we've probably all experienced this, it's just to put an ad up on your screen, a pop-up. Or maybe a pop-up that says, oh, you've got malware. You should call us. This is this is Windows. <laughs> you should call us because we can fix it. By the way, don't fall for that. That's another way to get something on your system. So Microsoft's, everybody, Adobe, Apple, they're always fixing, 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 fixing. And it is true that over time, Windows XP and Windows Vista and Windows 7 got more and more reliable to the point where there weren't a lot of flaws. They're pretty reliable because they'd fixed them all. You know, everything they could find and bad guys didn't find more. Bad guys also move on after a while. You know, uh, there's a lot of XP and Vista machines out there still. And bad guys know they're not getting fixed. So if they really want a computer, problem is they're older computers. They're maybe not that interested in them. Maybe, you know, they're not business computers. To, but for whatever reason, I think bad guys kind of tend to work on more modern versions of the operating system. Nevertheless, there have been flaws in Vista and XP. If you're using Vista or XP and you're going online, you're going online kind of, it's not, it's not prudent. It's not cautious. You're going online with a system that potentially is exploitable without your doing anything. You just go to a website and it can take over your system. Maybe you say, well, I don't care if I get malware because there's nothing on this computer I don't need. I need, I can just, I can, that's fine. I'll just erase it and start over. Yeah, but it also, they also can use it to do bad things to other people on the internet. You don't want to be party to that. So I uh, look, you spend a lot of money on that computer and the operating system and you know it and it works and all the stuff you want to do works. Although I have to think after a while, because it's not just Microsoft that stops supporting Vista. Everybody else stops supporting Vista. And after a while, your programs aren't even going to work very well. You certainly can't run newer programs, newer browsers. You can't use a latest version of Chrome on XP or Firefox. You'll be using uh, on either XP or Vista uh, such an old version of Internet Explorer. That by itself is a major security flaw, major security hazard. The good news is you can use that old hardware and you can either put Windows 10 or 7 on it at some expense or you can get a free version of Linux and use that. And Linux is, you know, if you go to get, you know, Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U, for instance, one of the one of the best Linux, especially for people who are new to it. Download it. It's free. You can install it. It'll do you know pretty much everything your Windows will do. It can even run some Windows programs, although this is, takes a little more effort using Wine. But but it has its own browsers. It has Chrome. It has Firefox. It has its and they're up to date. It ha, it it is being kept up to date. It's an army of volunteers are keeping these Linux programs up to date. And in general, I think they are more secure. I'd certainly if you if you said well I, I, which is more secure. Uh, Ubuntu Linux or Windows XP, I'd say get Ubuntu Linux. It's much more secure. Or maybe look at a Chromebook. Maybe get a new computer and get a Chromebook that is a super secure system and has always been kept up to date. But just remember, a 10-year-old computer, not only is it slow and old and prone to, to failure, its operating system is out of date as well. And that means you're very vulnerable to bad guys. And so I just, I, I, I feel bad. It's not like a classic car. Although you could make a case those are a little dangerous too without airbags and any lock brake systems, but that's that's for another show, not this one. It is it is really just an an old piece of software on old hardware, and and it's dangerous to use both for you and the internet at large. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is one of those reports I'd prefer not to make. This tragedy is supposed to remind us of how dangerous tower work can be, despite years of our own personal experience. In Cleveland, North Carolina last year, three men fell 1,000 feet to their deaths. 
the three people ages 40, 19, and 16 years old shall go unnamed here, but they were painting a 1,500-foot tall broadcast tower owned by WFMX-FM. There was a problem with the winch used to raise and lower the work platform they were using during this tower painting job. The cable became disconnected from the winch, which allowed the basket and the three men to fall to their deaths. No foul play was suspected. As hams, we can benefit from this horrible accident by learning about one of the dangers of tower work I have reinforced in the years this series has been on the air. Since, as hobbyists, we can pick and choose our tower jobs, the ones you should always refuse are the ones where your safety is obviously and totally in the hands of another person. I would also strongly recommend using two attachment systems to secure you to the tower when you arrive at your work site on the tower. When I'm working on a sidearm, I strap myself to the sidearm and to the tower. If the sidearm broke away, the heavy strap above me would catch and hold both me and the sidearm. My upper sidearm strap is very lightweight but strong enough to pull even my truck from a ditch during the winter. My harness goes around my waist and between my legs, and my shoulder harness is joined to my belt. I attach at the chest and waist to the tower. If either system fails, the other is more than sufficient to take over the entire job of securing me to the tower. Next time you climb, keep in mind this horrible accident and work with me to make this year tower accident free. Always use two attachment systems and plan your work around safety. No mistake about it, tower work at any height can become deadly if you don't use the proper safety gear. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey made her amateur radio debut on the air on December the 14th, the state's 198th birthday, and at the same time became the first person to use the state's bicentennial call sign, AL2C. Alabama will celebrate its 200th anniversary in 2019, with AL2C being on the air for two years as part of the statewide celebration. The Alabama Bicentennial Amateur Radio Club set up a D-Star VHF station in the Old House Chamber at the Alabama State Capitol in Birmingham. After announcing the Alabama Bicentennial Schools Initiative, Governor Ivey proceeded to the radio station initiating contact with Lee County Emergency Management Agency personnel. The governor discussed the Alabama Bicentennial over the air with Otto Arnasht, N4UZZ, the AL2C call sign trustee, serving as the control operator. On the other end of the conversation at Lee County Emergency Management Agency headquarters was Mike Watkins, WX4AL, the District Delta Emergency Coordinator for Aries and Lee County Aries Emergency Coordinator. Changes in the density and structure of the ionosphere affects the transmission path at high frequencies and can even block HF radio signals completely. The ionosphere relies on sunspot radiation. The more there are usually, the better the propagation. The solar cycle or solar magnetic activity cycle is the periodic 11-year change in the sun's activity and appearance. We are still in solar cycle 24, which is the 24th since 1755, when extensive recording of it began. The present cycle started in December 2008. It reached a maximum in April 2014, with the smooth sunspot number only 116.4, the lowest in over a century and scientists can't explain the sun's bizarre behavior, being divided between it being a fluke or a sign of a deeper trend. In 2017, there have been more than 100 days with no sunspots. The next cycle, 25, is predicted to start by 2020, peaking about 2024 through 2025, and forecast to be another weak one. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the Propagation Forecast for Friday, January the 5th. The sun has been spotless for the last several days, although a tiny spot appeared today, but it will vanish very soon. The solar flux index is wallowing in the low 70s, and this translates into mediocre conditions on the higher HF bands. However, conditions are forecast to be reasonably good on 80 and 40 meters at night, and that's good news for the Ritty Roundup contest this weekend. There is a stream of solar particles headed our way, and it's expected to arrive early next week and cause some unsettled conditions, but nothing severe. 
on VHF and UHF, the hot spots for tropospheric ducting appear to be in Southern California, Eastern Utah, Western Colorado, and Northern Minnesota. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. We hope you all enjoyed the satellites over the holiday and were able to operate on New Year's CW on satellite. For the new year, AMSAT has come out with a brand new award. It is the AMSAT Rover Award. Instead of simply operating a certain number of contacts on various satellites, this award gives bonus points for operating from a double or quadruple grid square, from operating Maritime Mobile, and for posting your rover venture on social media and writing an article for the AMSAT Journal. Take a look at the new award by going to AMSAT.org webpage, click on Services, then Awards. Are you searching for a really old issue of the AMSAT Journal? Phil KA9Q has been scanning and making the old journals available on the web. KA9Q.net slash newsletters.html. He has them all the way back to 1969. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. The Philippines Amateur Radio Association Ham Emergency Radio Operations Volunteers assisted with emergency communication support in the wake of two severe weather events. Tropical storm Kai Tak hit first in the central Philippines on December 16th, leaving nearly dozens dead and forcing others to evacuate. It was followed on December 22nd by the more severe tropical storm Tendon, which caused significant damage and claimed some 200 lives in the southern Philippines. Hundreds more are reported missing. Ham Radio Emergency Operations volunteers provided HF coordination through a national emergency net at 7.095 MHz. In addition, local clubs embedded with government responders used designated channels and club frequencies. Denny Berg, WB9MSM of Watertown, Wisconsin, reports that he achieved his goal of completing DXCC on December 31, 2017 using the new FT8 digital mode. It took him just four months. I can tell you that this mode is spreading like wildfire throughout all the HF bands Berg told the Daily DX. I've also noticed that most of these FT8ers use Logbook of the World for their confirmation process. Berg, an ARRL member, said his current DXCC count stands at 104 entities, all confirmed via Logbook of the World. He said he was able to work all states on FT8 in about six weeks of operating. A radio amateur since 1970, Berg was among the stations activating W1AW9 from Wisconsin during the ARRL Centennial in 2014. The 37th Annual ARRL Tapper Digital Communications Conference will take place September 14th through the 16th in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The Digital Communications Conference schedule includes technical and introductory forums, demonstrations, a Saturday evening banquet, and an in-depth Sunday seminar. The conference is for everyone with an interest in digital communications, from beginners to experts. Visit the Tapper website at www.tapr.org for more information or call area code 972-671-8277. From the Minnesota studios of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, sitting in for the Late Up Will Rogers with this rain report for December 30th. Are you experiencing extraneous noises or RFI to a ham rig in your home, car, or recreational vehicle? Well, from the You Think You've Got Problems department, imagine the racket Tiffin, Ohio trucker Jerry Sanford, N8 YMP, dealt with back in 1995. Here's an excerpt from his Hamvention Forum presentation from that year. I'm putting out 470 horses to the ground. I have a 342 rear ends with 18 speed overdrive transmission. With tractor and trailer combination, I have 130 lights throughout the whole unit. If you don't think that doesn't create some interference and alternator whine, man, I tell you, it really creates some unique situations. My truck has a 10 kilowatt generator on it. A lot of the new trucks today is all electronically motivated. As just a simple example is there's a linkage goes from the accelerator to the engine. It 
most cases today, that's not the case. It's all computer generated. There's a sensor in my, uh, it's like the Batmobile, you know, it's got a sensor in the accelerator and I push it down and it sends a signal to the engine and tells it how fast I want to go. Same with my cruise control. A lot of my variable functions, which are pneumatically operated with electro sensors. And so like my windshield wipers, it's all computer. I turn it on, it sends a sensor, which is electromagnetically sends it to the computer and then it generates air which runs my windshield wipers. I had to do a little customizing because of the clearance. Now I used to run an ILX bracket on the floor. Problem is I kept falling out of the truck when I tried to get around the thing. It gets rather cluttered especially in a, in a conventional org. It's even more so in a cab over unit. So what I did is I made a C bracket with the MB1 unit from the top. The MB1 makes it a quick release to get it in and out of the truck so I don't have to leave it there if I, if I decide to leave the truck over the weekend at the yard. Most of the time I take it home. I have on board my TM732. On top, I'm running a TS50 with the AT50 tuner. Uh, I'm running a Daiwa cross needle on there and then I have a Texas bug catcher outside the window. When you're driving a tractor trailer, it's a good idea to be watching where you're going when you're driving. So I needed a heads up environment. Everything we do most of the time is done on the floor. Ergonomics was ease of use because at night you know, without lights you have to be able to just find things and know where everything's at at the touch of a button especially when you're in really busy traffic and so my truck is 72 feet long, 8 feet 6 inches wide and 13 6 high. I wanted some functionality easy to use. It was equally important to me was to eliminate the clutter of the wires and coax. It's inherently I wanted to get rid of that. I accomplished this by routing the wires and coax into the headliner where the, the Alpine stereo is. That's all up there now. That creates a unique situation, folks, because my truck has the Alpine stereo. It's got two amplifiers on the left side, one for the front of the truck and one for the sleeper. They're 100 watt amplifiers for the stereo. I'm running a CD player. I got 10 speakers with two subwoofers underneath the bunk. I can really have, okay. But that creates some serious RF up there. When you get five, nine Q cells talking to Argentina, Russia, on 10 meters, you're doing something right. And I get five nines all the time. My radio is so quiet, people call me a liar right over the radio. Right you gotta be lying. I have no RF, I mean, I have none. I can put my radio on 100 watts. Now, if I have my, my CD going, for some reason I do get a little hum. So I'm between my honky-tonk woman and CQ, CQ, CQ. I have to turn off the stereo. It's just too close. But before I did what I'm gonna tell you here, it was like nightmare city. Okay, I had all kinds of problems. And so some things that I dis just discovered here over about two years of just playing and, and moving around has really paid off big for me. First, run shorter length of power cable to the battery. A lot of people run it directly, and I, I'm talking trucks here now. I had 25 feet of 10 gauge, really high quality wire going all the way from the radio to the batteries. Now I have four batteries. Believe it or not, and I haven't figured this out yet, when you run the batteries are in parallel, the third battery to the right on my radio is the quietest. I haven't figured that out yet. I cannot figure out why. Batteries sing. They do. They sing big time. They just, they sing. That's the best way I can describe it. You put it on the left side of my battery and you take this everything I got right here and throw it out the window. The second battery is a little bit better. Third battery is nothing. Go to the fourth battery and it's singing just a little bit. But I do recommend running shorter because the, the longer the length of the wire in the truck, was creating some RF, creating some problems. So what I did is I ran it directly from my radio to the fuse. I did have a dedicated fuse in the fuse box. And then I ran it from the fuse box to the battery. Now that's important because a lot of these trucks, they have solenoids. It goes from the fuse box to the solenoid to wherever you're gonna use it and then from the battery to the fuse box. And sometimes there's even a solenoid in between that. So you have to, depending on the truck, and mine there isn't. So I run dedicated to that and that helped a lot. What I did on top is I run styrofoam boards. <laughs> it works, can't tell you why, but it does. I layered the styrofoam boards and I would have all the, like the stereo amplifiers and everything, the wires, I put down a styrofoam board, I laid my electrical wires, put down more styrofoam boards and run my coax and wow, big difference. It really quieted things down and just little styrofoam boards, they seem to be a good insulator. Use only high quality coax. I can't stress this enough. 
the Peterbilt has just a standard RG58 foam filled trash, okay? It was really creating some problems for me in, in this environment. And I went to a polyethylene coax, Teflon's even better. I could only get polyethylene at the time. So I went to that and it works well. I'm using RG58 coax with the rubber boots, currently 259 connectors. I would like to go to the end connector. You may end up spending 60 to 80 bucks on coax, but I found it to be the better way to go. It's, it's such a hassle in doing something over again. I think you all know what I'm talking about. It's hard enough to do it the first time, but it's a real pain to do it a second time. But the only wires behind my radio is the wire going from the AT50 tuner to the TS50, and then out of the top I have it going to the Daiwa meter. But that's the only wires you see in my truck. The wires go up through the headliners like I described. Most mirror brackets are hollow. You don't have to have things coming out of the wings of the window. If it don't bother you, then you can have wires run out the window, but it bothers me. So I have them running right out the mirror brackets. And uh, my boss liked the idea so much on my last one. We now have our Peterbilt's custom ordered that way. All the coax goes out right to the antenna. It's very important to make sure your mirror bracket, of course, is grounded. Some units do have a, what they call it, uh, it's a, like a honeycomb shell composite body and that doesn't create a real good ground situation. Mine's aluminum and fiberglass and everything, and, and everything is really well grounded. But just to make sure, on the bottom, I run good ground wire on the inside of the bottom mirror bracket right here, back to the frame, and I got a real good ground. My antenna is a Texas bug catcher, and it does too. I have to clean the thing all the time. I was running a Hustler system, but I thought you guys would like to know this, because you know experience, sometimes if you can learn from somebody else. Hustlers, I was running the super resonators, and I had two problems. I had a 10, a 40, and an 80. First, my boss, and I have the greatest boss, but he didn't like this Martian looking setup going down the road. They call me Moon Man at work. Because of this antenna system, you know, it was not really sightly. I mean, it's a $150,000 truck, and I had all these, and it looked like a rolling antenna farm. He came to me, he said, Jerry, he says, you know, I, I love the fact that you have this hobby, and he says, you can do anything you want to do, but he said, could you do something about that? And I said, sure, boss. And so I went out and got the Texas bug catcher, and he, he likes that a lot better. The VP1 bracket, everybody knows what that is. Watch out for it. I have an 80 meter super res laying alongside the road in Michigan somewhere. They don't hold up. On the M04 and everything holds up on, but that VP1 bracket with the wind load doesn't hold up. I lost an 80 meter and I come, well, I almost lost a 40, but I saw it before it hit the ground. I picked it back up. And so, yeah, I would recommend that maybe you go to a fabricating shop and have like a good quarter inch stainless steel plate done in the same design or your own design. But the VP1, um, matter of fact, I talked to the people at Hustler and they agree that something needs to be done with it. I really recommend for those who are truckers in the room or even RV owners that want to go this route is to lean the antenna at least two to three inches below the threshold of the top of the trailer or of your vehicle because when you're going down the road it has a tendency to come back right because of the speed and it clips things that could really give you a bad hair day if you got a high unit. Because of the wind load and corrosion I'm using stainless steel mount. It doesn't look like it's very heavy duty but it's been holding up extremely well and rubber boots and of course the beehive it's but the only thing that'll keep that thing up there and uh, that's working extremely well for me right now it's working very very well and I've been through some really bad storms with the dog I've had ice hanging about a foot off the bottom of that thing and no problem just a big glob of ice and, and uh, like I said uh, one thing about the Texas bug catcher it also likes to catch ice too in a real cold situation because you know when you're driving wind you know wind chill can be a hundred below zero this was an excerpt from Jerry Sanford, an 8 YMP, a Tiffin, Ohio trucker who spoke at the 1995 Dayton Hamvention. I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, bidding you a race 73. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Foundations of Amateur Radio. There is a saying in my family, which I'll translate into English for you, no honour, it's not slippery. This came about when I was 10 or so and cycling with my grandmother. It was the middle of winter, it was cold, there was the promise of snow in the air, but nothing had actually fallen. On the little plants, twigs is probably a more accurate term, dotted alongside the cycle path, you could see little signs of frost. I was cycling on my shiny new bike and my grandmother was following behind. We came up to a corner on the cycle path and from behind my grandmother called out that I should be careful going around the corner because it was slippery. 
Being the indestructible ten-year-old, I call back, No, Grandma, it's not slippery! At which point I fell flat on my face. A few years ago I went on a camping trip with my local club to participate in a contest. One member had a treetop ute and the idea that we could use that as a base of operation. We planned on putting up a 10 meter yagi at the top of a pole. Before we started the process, I was asked to test the antenna. I plugged it into my radio, keyed up the PTT and noted that the SWR was as expected, good to go. We then set about attaching the antenna to a telescopic mast. The mast is one of those awkward contraptions. Each segment is about two and a half meters tall and standing on a ladder on the back of the ute is just enough height to get to the top of the segment. So you can push up the next and clamp it down. The segments are made of mild steel, so you need to be careful to keep the whole thing straight. Guy wires everywhere, people scattered all around holding on for dear life and needing a spanner to clamp down on the next segment because the locking pins had long vanished or ceased working. About two or so hours later, we finally had this contraption in the air. Using the Armstrong rotator, a rope that you pulled the Yagi around with, we could point the antenna and life was good. We had taped down the coax as we went, put in strain relief, got the whole thing just right. Plugged it in and whoa, what happened? The SWR was through the roof, no match on any band, all over the shop. Head scratching and animated discussion followed. After a little while, one of my friends asked me if I'd tested the antenna. I confirmed that I had, they'd even seen me do it. More head scratching, more animated discussion. I was asked again if I'd really tested the antenna. I confirmed that I had. They asked me how I tested the antenna. I showed them. I plugged in my radio, keyed the mic and showed them the SWR meter. All good, what's the problem? At that point, I was taught about having to actually put a signal out over SSB to test. If I'd used a mode like FM or PSK on my radio, all would have been revealed. But no sound means no power, means no standing wave ratio, since there's nothing to bounce. I'm reminded regularly of this event whenever I meet my friends. Not as snappy as, no, I know it's not slippery, but memorable nonetheless. During the week, I went to disconnect my radio. It had been sitting there for a fortnight monitoring whisper signals on 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. If you recall, I set it up a couple of months ago to monitor the HF bands. I've not yet done the final analysis on that, but I figured I should see if I could monitor the VHF and UHF bands. I attempted to set my radio up with two antennas, but WSJT-X doesn't seem to like doing both HF and VHF monitoring in the same band plan. It complains with an alert that you have VHF mode turned on when you're monitoring HF and stays quiet when you're monitoring VHF. So in the end, I turned off HF monitoring and started listening to 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. After two weeks of nothing, I turned it off. No reports, no point. A couple of amateurs contacted me and asked me if I was still monitoring. So I turned it on again. About a week later, I had to turn it all off overnight with a thunderstorm. But the next morning, I turned it all on again and left it running. I got a few more emails from amateurs asking if I was hearing their signals. I even set up a plan to do some testing this weekend, since we confirmed that I was listening to the correct frequency, but still not able to hear local 6 meter transmissions. As I said during the week, I went to disconnect my radio. I turned off the computer, turned off the power supply, and went to disconnect the antenna. At that point, I discovered that I'd been monitoring Whisper for the past fortnight or so without an antenna connected. For icing on the cake, this morning I discovered that the squelch was set for my FM use on the local repeater. So unless the whisper signal was coming in loud and proud, even with an antenna connected, I would not have managed to hear it. All giggling aside, clearly doing something and failing, sometimes spectacularly, sometimes quietly to yourself, is the way to learn. I wonder what little adventures your life shared with you and what lessons you learned along the way. Feel free to share. I promise I won't laugh much. I'm on a Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. January 1st was the opening day of the AWRL International Grid Chase 2018, or IGC, and newly minted general class operator Katie Thompson, KI7HCX of Mount Vernon, Washington, used the occasion to embark on the chase and to get on the HF for the first time using her own call sign. The 11-year-old comes from a ham radio family. Her dad, Todd, is W7TAO, while her older brothers are Mason K7MWT, who's 15, and who upgraded to Amateur Extra 
at the examination session where his sister upgraded to general and Tanner K7 TMT who's 13. She called CQ grid square chase on 20 meters and very quickly made 44 contacts her dad told the ARRL. She was very excited to work her first pileup and even had two Japanese stations. She's anxious to continue participating in the grid square chase. Todd Thompson said all three young radio amateurs are looking forward to participating in Rookie Roundup in April. The IGC is off to a rousing start, with more than 4,400 participants from around the globe already showing up on the leaderboard. Point totals for the International Grid Chase are shown for confirmed contacts only, and leaderboards are updated several times a day. They are not based on real-time data. All contacts on all bands except 60 meters are valid for grid chase credit, provided both stations upload their logs to Logbook of the World and get a match. The 3YOZ Bouvet Island de-expedition team announced in late December it had reached yet another milestone in its quest to activate Bouvet Island, the second most wanted DXCC entity behind the Democratic Republic of North Korea in January and February. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet is a sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic. For details on this exciting de-expedition, we go to Steve Ford, WB8IMY, reporting from League Headquarters. The de-expedition could get underway as early as January 23rd or 24th, and the team of crack operators hopes to spend 14 to 16 days on Bouvet. Bouvet Island has not been activated for about a decade. The de-expedition said it would transfer nearly $500,000 to a Chilean company that owns and operates the ship MV Bentanzos and the helicopters that will provide transportation between the ship and the island. The transportation outlay points up the extraordinary expense of mounting a de-expedition of this kind, and the team continues to invite contributions to defray its costs. In August, the Northern California DX Association announced its largest contribution ever, $100,000, to the Bouvet Island de-expedition. ARRL is also granted a Colvin Award to help support the effort. The 3Y0Z team said it's on schedule for a January 13th departure. Team members will gather in Punta Arenas, Chile by January 10th, attend a day-and-a-half marine safety course, purchase last-minute supplies, and then fly across the Drake Passage to King George Island in the South Shetlands, where they will board the newly refurbished Bentanzos for an approximately 10-day voyage to Bouvet. The team anticipates a propagation-driven operation with two high-power stations on every open band using gain antennas. Primary modes will be CW, SSB, and RIDI. The 3YOZ team, which consists of 20 highly experienced radio amateurs, said it's on schedule for the January 13th departure to Bouvet Island, the most remote island on Earth. Two helicopters will transport the team and gear to and from Bouvet. There's been a thorough review of landing procedures and shelter and antenna layouts, the news release said. We have three alternative anchoring systems to secure the shelters and antennas to the ice on the surface of Bouvet, so the plan remains unchanged. 3YOZ anticipates that FT-8 will be utilized if it's the only productive mode. The Bouvet team advises FT-8 enthusiasts to read the 3YOZ FT-8 protocol on the band plan page. The website includes complete information on band plans and frequencies, propagation predictions, and QSL procedures. The 3YOZ team leaders are Bob Alfin, K4UEE, Ralph Fedor, K0IR, and Erling Wig, LA6VM. Among them, the Bouvet D Expedition leaders hold 11 D Expeditions of the Year awards and have activated a dozen top 10 DXCC entities. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the W0GMM repeater on 147.285 MHz in Grove, Oklahoma, as part of the Amateur Radio Information Net, Monday evenings at 7 p.m. 
And finally this week, the Wireless Institute of Australia is reporting that after 171 years, the commercial telegram service in Belgium has ended. It was operated by the state-owned telecommunications company with the last telegram sent on December 29th. A lot of seasonal greetings traffic was generated to take advantage of the nostalgic occasion. Earlier, it was announced that India farewelled its telegram service in 2013 after 162 years of service. Belgium had still offered the service while around the world it had been replaced. Australia ended its publicly provided telegraph service in 1993. Firstly, the dial-up telex service made big inroads, then came fax and email. The telegraph used to carry Morse code across nations and link countries via submarine cables and was much faster than mail. The telegram has been overtaken by modern, faster technology, which gives the ability to get an almost instant reply, let alone cheap smartphones and computers that have both voice and visual communications. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League's ARRL Letter and Audio News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, The Rain Report, Australia's Q News, the RSGB, NASA, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, amateur radio websites around the world, news sources on the internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.